There are a few things that I want to do tonight. I want to mm, talk about some of the ideas that are in the book, but also kind of move that forward, uh, driving forward into implications, driving forward into a more careful thinking about remedies, the word I was using with Toby, what are some of the things that we can start contemplating as the way that we come together to move through and beyond this age of surveillance capitalism, which, as you know, if, you, um, if you've read the book, or at least maybe read the first page and the last page, <laughs> on the last page I say, the age of surveillance capitalism, may it be a short one. And uh, that, of course, is, is up to us. So, funnily enough, Toby brought up the New York Times, and I'm going to start with the New York Times. And this is a piece from the New York Times. Um, you know what the Federal Trade Commission is? The Federal Trade Commission is the, that's the agency in the United States that now has most of the jurisdiction over commerce on the internet. So when we think about regulating the uh, surveillance capitalists, we're talking about the Federal Trade Commission. So here's a New York Times reporter who's describing what he calls an unusually heated debate about privacy, individual rights, and law at the Federal Trade Commission. And he says, <clears throat> of course, industry was represented there, and civil society was represented there. And um, the, <clears throat> the industry executives were arguing, quote, they argued that they were capable of regulating themselves and that government intervention would be costly, and remember this word because we're going to come back to it later, counterproductive. All right, so that's the executives. The civil libertarians were warning that the company's data collection and analysis capabilities posed, quote, an unprecedented threat to individual freedom. Then there was another advocate there, someone else from a a civil society organization, and this is what he said, quote, we have to decide what human beings are in the electronic age. Are we just going to be chattel for commerce? Finally, one of the commissioners asks the following question, where should we draw the line? Now, all of this sounds familiar to you, doesn't it? Does it sound familiar? Familiar debate? Familiar points of view? What's so interesting about this article, it was published in 1997. Right. So, I think we know the outcome of the story. Who won the argument? So the executives won the argument, and uh, they got their way. They got everything they asked for. In the United States, more than in Germany and more than in Europe, but still, relatively speaking, a near absence of law for them to be able to do what they wanted to do. Surveillance capitalism is the fruit of this victory, of a battle that already those battle lines were drawn in 1997 at the dawn of the internet. <clears throat> so, what is surveillance capitalism? It rests on the discovery that private human experience was to be the last virgin wood available for extraction, production, commodification, and sales. People, that means us, we did become chattel 
for commerce. That's exactly what happened. And the results are shaking democracy to its core. They're transforming our daily lives. They're challenging the social contracts that we've inherited from the Enlightenment and indeed threatening the very viability of human freedom, just as was predicted. Under siege, though it may be, the only possible remedy for all of this is democracy. And that's why we're here tonight, of course. So I think about it this way a little bit. You know the story of Alice in Wonderland, yes? Everybody know the story of Alice in Wonderland? And you remember the white rabbit who had the clock and he was rushing and uh, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date and he goes down the rabbit hole. Well, the way I think about it is uh, two decades ago, we were all Alice and we encountered the white rabbit and he was rushing down his hole and just like Alice, we rushed after him. We followed the white rabbit into Wonderland. What happened in Wonderland? In Wonderland, there were various things that we learned and it took us two decades to learn them. Okay, first of all, we learned that we can search Google. We search Google. But now, two decades later, there is a fragile new awareness dawning. And it's occurring to us that it's not so much that we search Google, it's that Google searches us. In Wonderland, we assume that we use social media. But now, we've begun to understand that social media uses us. We thought that these are great free services. While these companies were thinking, these are great people who are free, free raw material for our new operations of analysis, production, and sales. We barely questioned why our television sets or our mattresses came with privacy policies. But now we're beginning to understand that privacy policies are actually surveillance policies. We admired the tech giants as innovative companies. But now, <clears throat> innovative companies, by the way, who occasionally made some big mistakes, and those mistakes violated our privacy. The difference now is that we're beginning to understand that those mistakes actually are the innovations. Those mistakes are the innovations. In Wonderland, we learn to believe that privacy is private. We failed to reckon with the profound distinction between a society that cherishes principles of individual sovereignty and one that lives by the social relations of the one-way mirror. Privacy is not private. Privacy is a collective action problem. Privacy is a political challenge. Privacy is about the kind of society that we live in. Finally, our most dangerous illusion of all in Wonderland. We believe that the internet offered unprecedented access to proprietary knowledge. But in the harsh glare of surveillance capitalism, we have come to learn that propri proprietary knowledge now has unprecedented access to us. The digital century was to have been democracy's golden age. 
Instead, we enter the third decade of the 21st century marked by an extreme new form of social inequality that threatens to remake society as it unmakes democracy. This new inequality is not based on what we can earn, but on what we can learn. It represents a focal shift from ownership of the means of production to ownership of the production of meaning. This is what I call epistemic inequality, defined as unequal access to learning, now imposed by private commercial mechanisms of information capture, production, analysis, and sales, best exemplified by the growing abyss between what we know and what can be known about us. Unequal knowledge about us produces unequal power over us. And so the abyss widens further, marking the distance now between what we can do and what can be done to us. These growing asymmetries ensure that epistemic inequality will be a critical social contest of our time. 20th century industrial society was based on the division of labor, and it followed that the struggle for economic equality would shape the politics of that time. Our digital century shifts society's coordinates from a division of labor to a division of learning. And it follows that the struggle over access to knowledge and the power that is conferred by such knowledge will shape the politics of our time. These contests pivot on three essential questions about knowledge, authority, and power. And these frame the fight for epistemic rights and epistemic justice. Three questions. Who knows? Who decides who knows? Who decides who decides? The answers to these questions will determine the fate of equality after Wonderland. All right, let's talk a little bit about surveillance capitalism. Because this inequality is forged in the backstage operations of surveillance capitalism. It's one-way mirror operations, engineered for our ignorance, wrapped in a fog of rhetorical misdirection, euphemism, and mendacity. Invented at Google at the turn of the digital century, Surveillance capitalism begins with the secret theft of private human experience, now declared as free raw material for translation into behavioral data. These flows of behavioral data are conveyed now through complex supply chains, devices, apps, third parties, into a new kind of factory, computational factories, called artificial intelligence, machine intelligence, where the data are manufactured, as occurs in all factories, manufactured into products. But these now are specific kinds of computational products that are behavioral predictions, predictions of what we will do soon and later. <clears throat> in case you think I'm exaggerating, a leaked Facebook document, and I draw your attention to the word leaked. So there's a leaked Facebook document, came out uh, about two years ago, and maybe some of you read about it. It's a document about Facebook's computational factory, 
which they call their, quote, prediction engine. All right, so they're describing what happens in this artificial intelligence hub. And they note that the, their machine intelligence, their AI hub, is now capable of ingesting trillions of data points every day. And that the company is now able to produce six million predictions of human behavior each second. That's what's happening inside the factory. So these predictions are about us, but they're not for us. Where, where do they go? They're sold to business customers. It turns out that businesses are very interested in what we're going to do. They're very interested in our futures. So they're sold to business customers in a new kind of market that trades exclusively in human futures, our futures, like we have markets that trade in wheat futures and pork belly futures and oil futures. We now have markets that trade in human futures. In other words, surveillance capitalists sell certainty. That means they're competing with each other on the quality of their predictions. And this is a form of trade that has birthed the richest and most powerful companies in history. All right, so this was invented at Google. The invention process began 2000, 2001, and um, we didn't start to learn anything about it really until the company went public, which was 2004. And they had to make public their, their initial public offering documents. So here's what we learned from those documents. And this is really crazy, so listen to this number I'm about to say. Between 2000 and 2004, their revenue line, now let me underscore something. 2000, why did they invent surveillance capitalism? You remember what 2000 was? I can't see you that, oh, now I can see you a little bit better. So, a lot of people in this room don't remember 2000. <laughs> because you either weren't born or you were too little. 2000 was a time called the dot-com bust. Everybody in Silicon Valley was going broke and they were all panicked. That's when Google uh, announced a state of uh, emergency. They declared that famous state of exception where they were gonna let go of all of their previously held values and principles and that's how they invented surveillance capitalism. But the point here is that they were in financial emergency in 2000 because they couldn't figure out a way to monetize and their own uh, venture capitalists were threatening to pull out, okay? So that's the background here. Let's get back to the story. So between 2000 and 2004, the revenue line, and of course, these are the years where they invented this new logic and started applying it, okay? So everybody clear on this? Between 2000 and 2004, now we're finally gonna get to the punchline. <laughs> their revenues increased by 3,000. 590%. That's a very big number. Okay, so what is that? This is a startling number, and this number represents something that I call the surveillance dividend. That number would not be there were it not for this new logic of surveillance capitalism that I've just described to you the surveillance dividend. And what did that do, literally overnight? It raised the bar for every investment. First in Silicon Valley, in the tech sector, but eventually, of course, this has had effects through all economic sectors across our economies, right? But now, imagine you're a venture capitalist, you're an investor, you're a Wall Street analyst. You can invest in a company that can increase its revenues 
in four or five years by 3,590%. Or you can, in, you can invest in a company that's going to do innovation the older way, like Henry Ford, and actually invent a product that everybody wants. Which one are you going to invest in? Right? The answer is obvious. The surveillance dividend. All right. So what do we learn here? The surveillance dividend is the center of this. Surveillance capitalism produces the surveillance dividend, which has driven this logic, not only through the tech sector, but through our economies. Surveillance capitalism is not the same as technology. Surveillance capitalism is not an inevitable consequence of digital technology. Surveillance capitalism is not restricted to technology companies. It redefines businesses in every sector now. So I'm going to tell you a great story about this. This is a story about chasing the surveillance dividend and what's happening inside our economies, all right? Let's go back to the beginning of the 20th century and the Ford Motor Company, the birthplace of mass production as we know it. You remember the Model T, Ford, Henry Ford, the Model T, the most successful product ever sold until the iPod. So today we have the Ford Motor Company and a new CEO, not Henry Ford. This CEO, Jim Hackett, is facing what some of you may know, a global slump in auto sales. Auto sales are down and they're not coming back. What is the CEO of Ford Motor Company to do? Well, if you were Henry Ford, you might say, hey, I know, let's invent a car that will actually compel people to buy it. How about a car that's completely affordable and doesn't burn any carbon? That's a good idea. That's not what Ford Motor Company is up to. Mr. Hackett says, I want to attract investment the same way that Facebook and Google do. So what I need to do is I need to find data. Wait a minute, I've got a great idea, he says. There are 100 million people driving Ford vehicles. So let's stream data from all those people. Then we can combine it with the data we have in the Ford credit business, where he says we already know everything about you. Now we have a data set, we have data flows that are on a par with Google and Facebook, who would not want to invest in us? Chasing the surveillance dividend. No more cars, he says. Now we have a transportation operating system. Chasing the surveillance dividend. And here's what a Wall Street analyst says about it. Listen. This is a great idea, he says. Ford could make a fortune monetizing these data flows. They won't need engineers. They won't need workers. They won't need factories. And they won't need dealers. Pure profit. It's pure profit. They can make a fortune. OK. So you've got the picture now. We're following the money. Follow the money. That is the whole point here. An economic logic, human-made. Let's follow the money and see where it leads us. You ready? Yes? All right. So to follow the money, what do we have to do? We have to look at the competitive dynamics inside this kind of marketplace. Remember what kind of marketplace it is? It trades in human futures, right? What are the competitive dynamics in this kind of marketplace? So we said surveillance capitalists sell certainty. So they're competing on their predictions. So let's reverse engineer these competitive dynamics and see what we find. Well, number one, everybody knows an AI needs a lot of data, right? Everybody knows that. So the first thing is economies of scale drives them toward totalities of information. We need, we need data at scale. Okay, that's an easy one. 
competing on scale is good but not good enough because eventually they realize, hey, you know what? We need a lot of data, but we also need varieties of data. So now we know that we need economies of scale, but we also need varieties, so we need economies of scope, different kinds of data. <coughs> now, even though you're not old enough to remember the dot-com bust, many of you are old enough to remember the mobility revolution, right? So this is the idea that we give you a, a little computer, you put it in your pocket, and you go. We'll, we'll, we'll call it a phone, what the heck. And uh, it will go everywhere with you, and now we can get economies of scope, like where you are, and uh, what you're talking about, and who you're with, and um, what transactions you're making, and maybe where you're eating, and what you're eating, and um, who you're emailing, or texting, or what kind of uh, browsing you're doing while you're uh, walking in the park or walking through the city. Um, we can get your voice. We can get all kinds of things now. Oh, and don't forget, what's the most important thing of all that we can get with this new computer? We can get your face. We can get all your faces. Okay, so we've got economies of scale and economies of scope. Prediction continues to evolve and competition continues to intensify. And pretty soon there's a new realization. The most predictive data comes from intervening, <coughs> intervening, <laughs> excuse me, in your behavior. Intervening in your behavior, intervening in the state of play in order to actually nudge, coax, tune, herd your behavior in the direction of the outcomes that we are guaranteeing to our business customers. Hurting your behavior in the direction of our revenues and ultimately our profits. Okay, so this is, this is something new. This isn't just scale and scope with which we're familiar with. This is something new and this <coughs> tracks a process that data scientists talk about they talk about the shift from monitoring to actuation. And that shift is a point um, in uh, systems management where you have so much information about that system that it, the, <coughs> excuse me, the information cascades over a tipping point. And you have so much information that with that cascade, you can begin to remotely control the system. So you, <coughs> you now know so much about it that you can remotely control it. That happens in the management of machine systems. But now the idea is how do we make this work in the management of <coughs> human systems? Human systems. Monitoring to actuation. Okay. So the idea now is we've got to figure out how to do this. This has never been done before at scale. Automated at scale. <coughs> so this is what I call economies of action. Economies of scale, economies of scope, familiar. Economies of action. How do we <coughs> automate Remote control human behavior at scale. All right, so this is a whole new experimental zone. This is something that has never been done before. It's hard to learn about it because as I said at the beginning, these are backstage operations. But it turns out some of these experiments are hiding in plain sight. And we can learn something about it. So one of these, something that you probably read about, now I know you're old enough to, to know about this, the Facebook, what they call their massive scale contagion experiments. So they did one in two, one, published one in 2012, another one in 2014. The first one was to see if they could change people's voting behavior 
not necessarily who they voted for, but just to get them to go vote rather than not voting at all. The second one was to see if they could change people's emotions, make them happier or sadder. These experiments, both 2012, 2014, they celebrated two findings. Number one, we now know that we can manipulate subliminal cues and social comparison dynamics on Facebook pages to change real world behavior and emotion. We know we can do that. Number two, we now know that we can do this while bypassing user awareness. It's undetectable. They never know that we're doing it. That's what makes successful economies of action. Why? Because awareness is friction. Friction is expensive. If I know about it, I might refuse. I might look for a way to hide. I might look for a way to camouflage. So awareness is friction. Awareness is the enemy. These kinds of systems have to be designed to bypass awareness. OK, great. Contagion experiments. Now we're on to an even more sophisticated zone of experimentation. And this one I am certain that you know about. How many people in this room went out in the streets of Berlin and played Pokemon Go with your friends and family? Come on, audience participation. You can be honest, we're all friends here. Oh, don't be shy, don't be, I know this isn't true. I know you're not telling the truth. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Well, did you know? Did you know that Pokemon Go came from Google? Did you know? So, is that because you read my book? <laughs> so, Pokemon Go was incubated in Google. Now, of course, Germany was famous for being the first country to contest Street View, right? And uh, Pokemon Go was invented by the same guy who was the boss of Street View, who was the same guy who invented Google Earth. Before that, it was called Keyhole, and it was invested in by the CIA before uh, Google bought it. So this is a man, John Hankey, who has a long history how to fill the supply chains, how to fill the supply chains on their way to the new factories. So this man, John Hankey, had a little shop inside Google, it's called Niantic Labs, and that's where they incubated these new augmented reality games, including Pokemon Go. When they brought it to the market, of course, they distanced themselves from Google. Niantic Labs became an independent little company and brought it to market that way, so no one would know that this came out of Google. Turns out that when you were playing Pokemon Go, you were actually playing a little game within a bigger game. All right, so let's go back to the first round of surveillance capitalism. What was the first really, really successful prediction product? Okay, that was the click-through rate. Because the click-through rate, we think of it as a click-through rate, but actually just you only have to think about it for another couple of seconds and you realize that the click-through rate is a computational fragment that's predicting a piece of human behavior, right? And of course, what were the first markets in human futures? That's where these click-through rates were sold, these predictions were sold. So that first market, insanely lucrative market in human futures, was called online targeted advertising. And it's still insanely lucrative. However, we now see that same structure now juxtaposed, um, translated to the real world. In Pokemon Go, Niantic Labs had established its own human futures markets. So they had business customers, not online, but in real life, like McDonald's and Starbucks the real shops, the real establishments, or Joe's Pizza and Harry's Bar. So they had these businesses paying them 
not for guaranteed click-through, but for guaranteed footfall. People's real feet falling on the real floor of real places. Guaranteed footfall. And so the idea with Pokemon Go was how to use gamification, the rewards and punishments of gamification, in order to herd people through the cities to the places where their feet were guaranteed to be. Right? So that's another phase in the work of economies of action and figuring that out. Now, here's another phase. Comes a little bit later, and now we're back at Facebook. And this comes from another leaked document, this one written by Australian Facebook executives. And, well, I don't know if they were, they were Australian, let me put it, let me put that another way. This was written by Facebook executives, written for its Australian and New Zealand customers. I've always kind of assume, assumed that the executives were Australian, but I don't know that for a fact. Okay, so this is a report that is selling its business customers on the following idea. We have so much information. Now remember, monitoring to actuation. We have so much information on 6.4 million young people, high school students, college students, and young adults in Australia and New Zealand that we can now predict their emotional state on a daily and weekly basis. We can see their emotional cycles across the seven days of the week, and we can predict where they are going to be in this emotional cycle. We can predict things like if they feel stressed, defeated, overwhelmed, anxious, nervous, stupid, silly, useless, or a failure. And with these predictions, we can alert you to the exact moment of maximum vulnerability when, if you send a message that contains a confidence boost, you will be successful. So, for example, let's imagine that you have um, a sexy black leather jacket to sell. Well, we can tell you when to sell it, how to sell it, what to say in your message, and by the way, make sure they know you're gonna sell it on a Thursday night because that's when they're most anxious because the weekend is about to appear. Tell them that you can have it delivered for free to their door the next morning. Throw in a little price discount and we can guarantee you success. All right, so that's Another phase, economies of action, monitoring to actuation. Finally, we're seeing the next phase un unveil itself now, literally as we speak. Some of you who follow smart city, smart city developments might know that just the other day, the officials in Toronto made some decisions about how Sidewalk Labs, Sidewalk Labs is the subsidiary of Google slash Alphabet that specializes in its smart city work. You know that they used to call it the Google City, but they don't do that anymore. They call it the smart city. Smart city, uh, they're trying to get the waterfront area in Toronto to rebuild as a Google city. And this is uh, a dynamic that's been going on for a couple of years, become very contested with many citizens getting involved. And just the other day, um, some of these officials in Toronto actually made a very good decision and uh, curtailed the, the development of this plan substantially. But the, the key point here is that when you look at the documents behind this um, Sidewalk Labs proposal, and, um, and in fact, just last week, the Globe and Mail found some secret documents, documents that really hadn't been reviewed by the public and, and, uh, and finally made them public. And it's fascinating what you see there because um, 
all of these documents, if you read them with what we've just been talking about in mind, these are documents that are a clear declaration of epistemic dominance and, and the intention to use that dominance for behavioral modification at scale. I'm not gonna go into the, into the details, but you can trust me on that. All right, so, um, you know, sometimes I hear people saying to me, you know, Shoshana, I mean, take your point, but really, businesses, advertisers, commerce, always try to persuade people. You know, always try to change people's behavior and get them to buy something that they didn't want to buy. So really, Shoshana, there's nothing new about this. And of course, that's true. There is nothing new about our desire to persuade each other to do things that we might not have otherwise done, or maybe to do things that we don't even want to do. There's nothing new about human persuasion. But let's not lose our bearings. Because what is new here is that at no other time in history have the wealthiest private corporations had at their disposal a pervasive global architecture of ubiquitous computation able to amass unparalleled concentrations of information about individuals, groups, and populations sufficient to mobilize the pivot from the monitoring to the actuation of behavior remotely and at scale. This, my friends, is unprecedented. What is this new power? It works its will through the medium of digital instrumentation. It's not sending anybody to our homes at night to take us to the gulag or the camp. It's not threatening us with murder or terror. It is not totalitarian power. But it is a new and unprecedented form of power, just as totalitarian, totalitarianism, totalitarianism presented itself as a new and unprecedented power in the 20th century. This new power is what I call instrumentarian power. It works its will remotely. It comes to us secretly, quietly, and if we ever know it's there, it might actually greet us with a cappuccino and a smile. <laughs> Nevertheless, it represents a global means of behavioral modification and is the engine of growth for surveillance capitalism. Okay, so here we, we've now climbed a mountain. We've climbed the mountain of the division of learning. And we've peeked inside the fortress, into the AI hub, into these backstage operations. And what have we found? A frontier operation run by geniuses, funded by immense amounts of capital. Are they solving the climate crisis? Are they curing cancers? Are they figuring out how to get rid of all those plastic particles that now even are detectable in the Arctic snow? No, they're not doing any of that. Instead, all of that genius and all of that capital is dedicated to knowing everything about us and pivoting that knowledge to the remote control of people for profit. I, I don't like that. This is how the age of surveillance capitalism becomes an age of conquest. So, you know, we're meant to sleepwalk through all of this. We're meant to be ignorant. This is engineered for our ignorance. Mark Zuckerberg says privacy is the future. Very confusing. <laughs> the, 
They just really think that we're stupid. And because we're meant to sleepwalk through this, when something actually rises up out of the fog to send us a message, well, it's crazy. I mean, it really gets our attention. This is what happened with Cambridge Analytica, isn't it? Chris Wiley, here's the whistleblower now. Chris Wiley says, this is what we've been doing. That really got our attention. Let's just take a minute and look at what Chris said Cambridge Analytica was doing. He said, quote, we exploited Facebook to harvest millions of people's profiles. And then we built models to exploit what we knew about them and target their, target their inner demons. Does that sound familiar? Does it? He says, <clears throat> the objective was behavioral micro-targeting, influencing voters based not on their demographics but on their personalities. Does that sound familiar? He says, I think it's worse than bullying because at least with bullying, uh, <clears throat> people know what's being done to them. They have some kind of agency. With what we do, he said, people don't even know what's being done to them. He says, if you do not respect the agency of people, then anything you're doing after that point is not conducive to a democracy. Well, yeah, that's for sure. All right, so then he concludes. He says, Cambridge Analytica was information warfare correctly acknowledging that information warfare originates in epistemic inequality. Information warfare is impossible to prosecute without that information dominance, that information advantage. But what remains poorly understood even today is that Cambridge Analytica only repeated the mechanisms and methods that represent everyday life for every self-respecting surveillance capitalist. I mean, what more um, apt description of the treatment of those young people in Australia and New Zealand uh, whose social anxieties were manipulated for profit uh, than to say we built models to exploit their inner demons. I mean, how apropos is that? So here is a, this political consultancy that got the world's attention and still has the world's attention when actually all it was, was a parasite, a parasite in the host. And the host body was not just Facebook. The host body was surveillance capitalism itself. It's surveillance capitalism that provided the three things that the people who study information warfare say are essential for its success. The conditions, the weapons, and the opportunity. It was surveillance capitalism that provided the conditions through the ubiquitous datification of human experience. It was surveillance capitalism that provided the weapons, the data, the methods, and the mechanisms, the predictive analyses, the intimate simulations of individuals, the behavioral micro-targeting, the techniques for subliminal influence and manipulation of social comparison dynamics, the mastery of hidden real-time experimentation, all of it pioneered in surveillance capitalism, the weapons. And finally, it was surveillance capitalism that provided the opportunity. The opportunity being, uh, <clears throat> 
the fact that uh, all of these uh, mechanisms can be applied while completely circumventing human awareness. It can all be done in secret. And that provides a massive opportunity for successful information warfare. The conclusion can only be that what we have failed to recognize is that it's not that Cambridge Analytica represents information warfare. And it's not that information warfare is strictly a function of the state or increasingly of even non-state but political actors. It turns out that surveillance capitalism and its illegitimate use of knowledge to power is best understood as the normalization and the institutionalization of information warfare for profit. That is the world that we are living in today. Okay. So, <clears throat> I want to conclude with just um, a couple of thoughts uh, that will allow us to turn the lights on in a, in a minute without everybody feeling really depressed. <laughs> because you may not be able to tell right now from my voice, which is a little warped, but I'm actually very optimistic about our ability to change this. And in fact, I'll be very candid with you. Some of my optimism comes from uh, your country. Uh, some of my optimism comes from seeing uh, how the generations in your country and in this city uh, learn to uh, confront and in internalize the lessons of totalitarianism and uh, completely change the fabric of your culture and your institutions and your laws. And I have so much respect for that. And I think it reminds us of a larger, a larger pattern here, which is that as democratic societies, we have confronted grave problems in the past and we have overcome them. We ended the Gilded Age. We overcame totalitarianism. And in fact, uh, uh, we have used the levers of our democracy in order to ensure that the post-war world became a prosperous world for ordinary people. That the post-war world was the age of the middle class. And that capitalism and uh, market capitalism could actually promote and itself be strengthened by democracy. And that was part of the legacy of the post-war years. So now we're living in a time when we understand that privacy is a collective action problem. And we have to look now to only one source for remedies here, and that source is democracy. That means law, and that means new regulatory paradigms. At least two things that I think are immediately important, and um, once we start talking about them and begin to get used to them a little bit in our imaginations, we essentially need to outlaw the surveillance dividend. Once we do that, we open up the competitive space 
for the thousands and hundreds of thousands and indeed millions of young people, entrepreneurs, companies who want to produce digital products and services that will address climate, that will address our real needs, that will cure the cancers that plague us, that will do all of the things that we once expected from the digital. But they will be able to do them without having to compete on the surveillance dividend. That's what we need. So <clears throat> two things I want to suggest. One is that we interrupt supply, and the other is that we interrupt demand. By interrupting supply, I mean that the illegitimate, secret, unilateral taking of human experience for translation into data should be illegal. <laughs> the surveillance capitalists have fought. This fight that you heard about in 1997 continues literally every day. They have fought for the right to take our faces whenever and wherever they want to. They take our faces on the street. They take our faces in the park. They take our faces when and wherever they want to. Our faces go into their facial recognition systems. Facial recognition systems train data sets. Data sets, we now find out, often sold to military operations, military divisions, including those military operations that are imprisoning members of the Uyghur minority in central China in an open air prison where the only walls are facial recognition systems. That's what I mean, by the way, privacy is not private. Okay, so we interrupt supply. The next thing that we can do is interrupt demand. And that means we eliminate the incentives to sell predictions of human behavior. How do we do that? We make markets that trade in human futures illegal. Other markets are illegal. Markets that trade in human organs are illegal. Why? Because they have predictably destructive consequences for people and for democracy. Markets that trade in human slaves are illegal because they have predictably destructive consequences. Markets that trade in human babies are illegal because they have predictably destructive consequences. Markets that trade in human futures should be illegal because first, they are the enemies of human autonomy, because their competitive dynamics require economies of action for which human agency is the enemy, and second, because they inevitably produce the extreme asymmetries of knowledge and the power that accrues to knowledge that create epistemic inequality an epistemic injustice. And now, the question is, not are you, are you um, old enough to know this, but are you young enough to know this? <laughs> Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg says, our house is on fire, succinctly framing the climate crisis, cataclysm, our house is on fire. So I'd like to suggest that global warming is to the planet, our house, what surveillance capitalism is to society, our home. Not only is our house on fire, but our home is on fire. This fire, though, is not kindled in the implacable physics of the climate crisis. It's kindled in a human-made logic, 
a human-made economic logic. Anything that humans make can be unmade. All we have to do is decide, like the Berlin Wall. You decided, and ultimately it came down. <coughs> Surveillance capitalists are rich and powerful, but they are not invulnerable. They have an Achilles heel. Do you know what that is? They fear law. They fear lawmakers who are not confused in, and intimidated. But ultimately, they fear you. They fear citizens who are ready to demand a digital future that we can call home. Thank you. <laughs>